Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the premiere episode of Professional Interpersonal Development. I'm your host, Martin French, Student Branch Advisor to IEEE UFT, and today we have a very special guest. For those of you who had recently been accepted to the University of Toronto Engineering Program, his voice may sound very familiar. He's a highly respected professor from the Edward S. Rogers Senior Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, and he's received numerous awards for his excellence in education. We're very fortunate to have him here with us today. So greetings, Professor Stickle. How are you feeling? Yeah, great. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot for having me here. It's nice to, to reconnect, Martin. Uh, we've seen each other, I guess, a couple of years ago. Uh, yeah, um, roughly, roughly a year ago. I was in your electricity and magnetism class. I think most engineering programs actually have you as a professor at, at one point because you teach the first year design course, don't you? So I, I have in the past taught APS 100, which is the orientation engineering course, which uh, a lot of first year students in engineering take. And I, I'm now not teaching that this coming year just because my role has changed a bit. And I'm working uh, in the vice provostial office uh, for the vice provost students. Mm -hmm. And so things have changed a little bit. So uh, somebody else is taking that on. But yeah, for many years, I taught that course. And uh, it's a really wonderful course uh, in terms of connecting with students and helping, uh, hopefully helping them transition a little bit more smoothly into the experience. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I haven't taken that, that course in particular. I've taken Praxis because I'm, a, I'm in engineering science, but from what I hear from my peers who have taken it, it sort of opens their eyes to the whole idea behind engineering. Because in high school, when you're really good at math and science, you know, it's mostly just an individual art. You get the grades, you get out. Right. But in engineering, you actually need to work with people and speak with stakeholders and understand yeah. the problem in a sort of grander scale. Yep. Yeah. So there's a great amount of appreciation I have in that aspect. So uh, I was looking at your biography and I noticed that you actually did your undergraduate uh, degree in U of T as well as your master's and your PhD. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a lifelong U of Tier. Uh, and it's not too common really in, in academia to stay around and be... Uh, uh, or stay at the, the same institution. Often people go off to different institutions for grad studies and, and then, you know, for, uh, you know, continuing their work in academia through postdocs or becoming a professor. Uh, so it's it's been really, I've been really grateful to be able to stay in Toronto and uh, stay uh, and be connected to such a great faculty and such a great institution. Um, and so, yeah, you know, I... I, I've appreciated the program when I was uh, growing up. I'd grown up mostly in Toronto. I, I came from the States when I was uh, 10, uh, but now Canadian and very glad to be here and mm -hmm. glad to be in Toronto. So it's, it's been nice to be able to stay here in Toronto and, and be affiliated with U of T. Definitely. So is there any particular drive that told you, you know, I want to do my master's at U of T and then told you, you know, I want to do my PhD. Yeah, it, it was an evolving process. So, you know, I, I remember in high school, n not as many people, not really totally knowing uh, what I wanted to do. I uh, was good at math and physics and appreciated those. And, and so I think as many high school students uh, face the uh, decision of where to apply, uh, I thought engineering sounded good. I, I remember, you know, reading through lots of brochures and lots of different programs and, you know, the draw to the uh, core of engineering, which was um, being thoughtful and uh, considerate about the use of technology for the betterment of society, certainly intrigued me and, and, and drew my interest. But uh, it took me a while, and at the very last minute, deciding, okay, I'll apply to engineering and I'll apply to electrical engineering, particularly uh, with kind of just a last minute whim and, and I, I delayed the decision as much as possible. I would have loved to have track one as a student coming out of uh, university and, and or high school to have that first year of university kind of thinking about um, what my path would be. Then, you know, to answer your question around being, doing a master's. So, you know, I didn't really know going into, you know, uh, undergrad where the, what my path would be. And uh, so it took me some years uh, and I remember approaching the end of my second year, still not really knowing what third, fourth year and beyond would be, uh, and sat down with a, an incredible professor, Professor Lavers, who's now uh, sadly passed on, but he was so kind 
thoughtful, considerate, and sat with me for, I think, a half an hour, 45 minutes, and basically kind of explained to me the, the options, you know, what, what existed within electrical engineering uh, beyond. And that, you know, that was the first connection I had made to um, a professor directly, sort of individually. And, um, and it really opened my eyes to the possibilities. And then I began to think about doing a master's. And, and, and as I approached doing that and working through that, getting experience as a TA, getting experience, uh, you know, kind of working directly with students. Uh, that's where it became pretty clear to me that what I wanted to do was teach. That was my focus. And um, so that's where the PhD became kind of uh, a necessity because I wanted to teach at university or within academia. And so that's, it was an evolving process and it took time. And I think that that's, the beauty of undergrad is that it hopefully affords most students time to explore, time to think, you know, and, and uh, to connect. I think connecting with fellow students, connecting with professors, connecting with industry professionals, you know, that's where you learn what the possibilities are. And before that, you, there's just no way to really uh, know or appreciate uh, what's out there. Yeah, definitely. I absolutely agree with you because especially when you're in high school and you don't really know much about the world, you create models of how things function. But then once you start doing these, these activities such as research or working in a lab, you know, you start to get more hands-on experience and understand exactly what it means to do this. And you, you ask yourself, can I really do this for five years? You know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> does this really gra grab me a lot of joy? One thing I, I also like really enjoy doing is like mentoring or teaching people as well. I find it very fulfilling to some extent because it's sort of like an investment. Yeah, you know, in thinking about kind of my pathway, there's a consistent theme of uh, having support and mentorship from, uh, you know, those that had come before and gone through this process before. So it could have been up for your students and, you know, uh, through Frost Week and that, those connections being made supported by uh, the work that these upper year students had put into that, that week for me personally. And then, you know, for that, our, our first year group. You know, it started there, but then throughout the years, um, taking advantage of those connections uh, has been something that's been uh, hugely beneficial to me. And I'm a natural in introvert, so I, I was pretty much not super social in undergrad. So it took me a little bit of effort to step out at times. And I didn't do a whole lot uh, as in terms of extracurriculars. Uh, and, and that's a regret I have actually, because it's such a vibrant part of the experience it can be. Um, but there were times where I stepped forward and I did take advantage of kind of going and talking to people individually or going to kind of uh, events. And that idea of mentorship support that's around us, and I think it's one of the tremendous things about our faculty is that we have students that care so much about the other students and want to help and support. And, and so there are lots of opportunities to take advantage of um, that. And, and so now, you know, I'm uh, a bit further on in my career. And so wherever I have the opportunity, as much as I possibly can, I'm trying to repay that uh, goodwill that has uh, led me along this path. Mm -hmm. Sort of pay it forward. Absolutely. There, there's, this, there's definitely a very strong sense of community in engineering. So I, I just want to take a step back and ask you, so when you were an undergrad, you're a bit of an introvert, right? Yeah. And did you attend Frosh at that time? Yeah, I did. So uh still am a bit of an introvert. <laughs> uh, you know, it's funny that way. But um, yeah, so I, I did. I did go to Frosh Week. And again, it was a little bit of uh, uh, must have been kind of a Mike, little bit to do that. Must have been kind of yeah. daunting. It was. And I can, I can clearly remember that first day uh, <laughs> driving down. And I did have a friend. So, you know, uh, 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 a really good friend of mine in high school. She was also in electrical engineering. So, you know, I had a bit of a connection, but we were in different frosh groups. So we drove down together. We had that kind of support, but uh, we were in different frosh groups. And so I did have to kind of reach out. And, and the interesting thing is within 15, 20 minutes, I had made uh, two great friends and we remained friends throughout first year. Got, you know, got kind of us all through our first year, Steve and Ryan, and we were in different programs. So in the end, we 
kind of went our separate ways after first year. Um, but yeah, just thinking of those connections made in those first little bit of Frosh Week really uh, uh, helped me tremendously through first year. Mm -hmm. I did go to Frosh as well. Uh, dyed myself purple completely. My dreadlocks like just kept coloring my bathtub. It was hilarious. For, for yeah. weeks and weeks, right? Yeah. yeah, for weeks and weeks. But yeah, Frosh is definitely a, a very moving experience as a first introduction to university and sort of engineering specifically. I think the engineering Frosh is like very, very connection social oriented so that's that's why i really greatly appreciate it um, absolutely and it's a it's a really important experience and so you know as the vice dean first year for the past uh, eight years and, and now moved on to a different role but seeing how it's evolved i i've been really um glad to see how the students have taken uh taken the lead in terms of making sure that it's 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 expanding its reach that it's uh providing different types of experiences for students coming in because you know not all people love to roll on on the floor like bacon like i did mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so there's different opportunities some of that is important because it does kind of cement your connection with each other through these kind of crazy activities and and that's i think important um but it has evolved to the point where i think it's it's really uh, a much more inclusive space now and um still lots more work to do i would say but uh, I think that the students have done an amazing job and I, I, you know, with the current pandemic and the changes that are certainly forced upon us, it's sad that some things won't be possible, but I know that the team has been doing an incredible job to figure out how do we cr still create this experience of community creation connection uh, in this virtual space. And, and so I know that they're working really hard to do that and I'm sure it's going to be a great experience. Mm -hmm. I have no doubt. As long as we get, to, as long as the students engage, you know, if you're looking to have a good time, you will usually have a good time, ninety percent yeah. of the time. So, I, I'm I'm definitely interested to see how that sort of plays out uh, this coming September. Yeah. So I want to ask you a question about being an educator. Being an educator requires a lot of effective communication. So could you tell us a bit of your tips on how you sort of go about expressing ideas? Yeah, you know, it's an ever evolving process for me. And I I've, uh, have worked on this and continue to work on this uh, since day one of my undergrad. One of the most effective courses I took in undergrad was the second year course on effective technical communication. And it was so helpful to just be um, given that experience of um, some basic ideas of that and now i think it's a lot better because that course essentially is now integrated throughout the curriculum for engineering students and so it's not just a single experience but it's actually now throughout the um uh the years which i think is a really important piece and uh and i've been happy to see that you know it's funny i was thinking about this and i, I as a kid you know i was taught these three things okay uh when you speak when you talk about uh, talk to your friends. Is it necessary? Is it truthful? And is it kind? Those are the kind of the three things and said, um, you know, those are the the ideas behind critiquing what you're going to say. And obviously, you never live up to all three of those all the time. But when I think about communication for me and in, in, in engineering, those three things still ring very true to me. So, you know, the brevity of speech, the careful use of language when I'm writing, uh, you know, not being too verbose, being to the point. That's something I'm working on. But the necessity is really, is this really nece necessary to say? Um, thinking about truthfulness and, and saying, you know, am I being true to representing um, other people's ideas or my own ideas uh, or representing the truth of the data or whatever it is? Trying to be really clear on that is critical. And then kind, being thoughtful and respectful of the language I'm using, being uh, critical of the biases that I'm bringing to my speech or to words. Um, it's still these three things, necessary, truthful, and kind. It, they, they ring true, and I think they're really important for in engineering. Uh, and, and so much of it for me, and I think what I've seen in other professionals that I admire, is developing uh, a... Uh, reputation for integrity, right? Having people know that they can trust what you're saying because you are very careful with your words uh, and that you are backing them up with um, kind of 
the truth of the situation. And, and so I, I, I strive for that still, again, as I said, it's an ever evolving process, uh, and things that I'm learning, but, um, I, that's what I hope is that, you know, uh, that that's a reputation that, uh, I can work towards developing. It's, it's kind of interesting that you mentioned, uh, kind is the third sort of, uh, characteristic of mm-hmm. effective communication. And I, I think in my communication, I usually don't try to include emotions, but implicitly I do when I'm talking to people because you can usually tell how they react based on their fish, uh, facial um, expressions and stuff like that. Right. Uh, a couple of times I've actually missed, uh, like used the wrong pronouns for cer- certain groups of people. But, you know, I, I was, I sort of didn't push back on it. I was, like, I was just like, okay, you know, if that's what you like to refer to, refer to as, then we'll go along with that, you know? Right. Like taking time and being compassionate, understanding of the situation because uh, you don't know their, their history or anything like that. So you got to understand. Yeah. You know, I, I, over these years, I've come to more greatly appreciate the impact of unconscious bias, the, the impact of microaggressions, the uh, difference between intention and impact. Right. Mm-hmm. And that the words that we use, we're responsible for the impact, not, what we intended by them. And that requires us to be more considerate about uh, and about learning how things might impact others. And as you say, you know, uh, being really considerate about the fact that you don't know what the experiences are of the people around you. You don't know uh, sort of what uh, they've gone through or what they've been through or how words might impact them. And so you have to be careful and thoughtful of that and you'll never get it perfect and when mistakes are made that's fine you can acknowledge it and be open to learning more yeah Uh, so like you said i think that uh you know pronunciation of of names or um uh, different groups as you say maybe you get it wrong but if you're open to learning i think that's what's the the important piece no definitely i mean people have gotten things wrong about me before too. It's, they look at me and they're not really too sure which, which background I'm from. Like, am I Jamaican? Am I Japanese? Am I Indian? You know? So I, I usually don't lash out at them. I understand like I'm fairly rare, you know, <laughs> somebody yeah. of my background. So I just, you know, say, listen, honest mistake. I would have made the exact same mistake in your position. You know, let's move forward from this and, you know, both learn. Yeah, absolutely. So that's definitely sort of, Something that's very important nowadays because people usually escalate things further if, if things don't go well or, but um, it's just important to have that compassion. Yeah. So I, I did want to ask you a, a question about this one particular idea. Mm-hmm. And I know you're going to know what it is because you had a talk about it <laughs> last okay. year. Imposter yeah. syndrome. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I think this is an experience that, every single, well, let's say engineering student, but I would say, you know, many students experience to different degrees. And um, for some, I think it can be entirely crippling. And uh, this notion essentially of, I don't belong here. I'm not good enough. I don't have what it takes um, to be wherever you are in whatever circumstance. And maybe it's as an engineering student, or maybe it's part of a design team um, and I can a hundred percent relate to this. You know, I throughout my whole undergrad and graduate studies would compare myself to those around me and see the talents that they had or see how easily they understood this material or, you know, see the success that they had in their research and, um, you know, the awards they might be winning or that kind of thing. And yeah, you just, for me, very natural to say, what the heck am I doing here? How did this ever happen that I ended up being admitted that I ended up being, uh, you know, allowed to continue, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, even though I did academically quite well, I, I still had these natural insecurities. Uh, and, and so I think for some, um, you know, it can be a real uh, significant piece. And, and I've certainly come to appreciate that. Uh, there's a whole set of layers that I never faced as, as a white male going through this institution, you know, that others are facing that make this uh, experience of being an imposter even much more significant. And, and as I said, sort of even more debilitating. So I think it's a really important topic to 
uh, talk about as students transition into university to address for them to at least be cognizant of. It's going to happen. You're going to feel these things. You will have experiences that will cause you to feel uh, less uh, than others, perhaps. And it's mm-hmm. so important to push back against that. And, you know, it, it takes a bit of um, you know, bravery, a bit of courage, a bit of, uh, you know, uh, belief in yourself. Yeah, it's, that it's also like you're fighting. here for a reason, right? Mm-hmm. That there's a reason for you to be here. And, and, that, and the other thing is recognizing that people have different talents. And that's took me some time that, yes, I, this person might be doing phenomenal in, in their research and be doing really super well. And that's great and wonderful to see. But there's other things that I'm bringing to the table and different experiences in different ways um, uh, that uh, in some ways are, are as beneficial to the people around me and to mm-hmm. society, right? And so I, I think I've, uh, I've tried to, and I still compare myself, but it's, I try to step back from that and say, well, try to look inside and say, you know, acknowledge the good things that I do have, right? And, 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 the, and the talents that I do have and, and try to focus on those as opposed to the deficiencies that I might see from uh, other things. And uh, so, yeah, I think it's a very important topic. Yeah, definitely. Sort of when you suffer from this sort of, uh, sort of effect, it's, it's almost like, you know, having to battle against your intuition, you know, some, you're telling yourself that you, you may not be worthy, but it's very difficult to change your intuition about things. And uh, it's, it's just very important to understand and look at things objectively, right? Even in my year, there's tons of people who have gone to like Google and Tesla and stuff like that. But I, I see that and I think, well, you know, there's two ways I can look at this. Why, why am I not working at Google? But I can flip it the other way. People from my program are working at Google. So maybe I can go to Google too. I'm with these guys. They're, they're my friends, you know, they're right. my colleagues. So yeah. I, it can be pathological and you can try to flip it both ways but it's just important that if it's if it's in a negative state you know you're able to recover and come out of it yeah you know unconscious biases are are a similar thing in the sense that once you start to just step back and pay attention to them as they come forward Mm -hmm. you see somebody on the street and, and you kind of make a snap judgment based on the many years of media and societal impacts parental impacts you know, that you can't control because they just exist given your upbringing. If you start to pay attention to those, uh, then you can, you know, uh, either engage those further or not. And Mm -hmm. and maybe engage a different judgment or a different thought or a different consideration. And it's the same kind of thing with imposter syndrome, right? Just being thoughtful and aware of those thoughts that come up and you're like, no, I'm not going to engage that. And, uh, And I think that, as you said, that kind of, uh, subconscious thinking, your intuition about things, um, at, in one sense is difficult to control because it's automatic. Um, mm-hmm. And that's a good thing that our, our physiology helps us with a lot of the automatic things. But being critical, being thoughtful of them, that's where you can begin to take charge. And, and I think that that's uh, uh, you know, where the power lies. Definitely. I mean, after all, we spent four years in engineering undergrad to develop an intuition for the fields that we're going into. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> and you want to rely on those in, in meaningful and uh, in good ways, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's not the, like the same should apply to other facets too. It's tools we carry over. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we're sort of uh, coming to a close on the, on the amount of uh, time we have available for our interview. Sure. So if there's a one final sort of idea or takeaway you'd like the students to have, feel free to share it. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think when I, when I think about um, students that are successful in, in seeing this pattern over the years, uh, and I look at alumni and see the success that they have, very rarely does it correlate with those that have 90% averages or high 80s or something like that. Um, Obviously, academic success is important. But I think one thing that I've found and and sort of appreciated in those that have found success in whatever way they measure it, because I think that that's different for every person, there's a a degree of self-awareness that they bring to the table. 
and uh, a little bit about paying attention to what works for them and what doesn't, right? So, you know, to be academically successful, you need to uh, know how to take notes, how to attend lectures, tutorials, take advantage of labs. You have to know how to study what works for you and what doesn't. And that takes awareness to try things and then go back and say, did that work or not? And then maybe try something different. And so I think this element of kind of being aware of, of uh, how you're developing as a person and what works well for you or not, this idea of self-awareness, is one of those critical um, pieces uh, that is at the heart of a lot of people's success. And, um, uh, and you know, we talk about in first year sort of related to this, this idea of ikigai or uh, roughly translated it's a Japanese concept, as I understand it, uh, that translates to the reason for getting out of bed in the morning. <laughs> and, and, and this idea of why would you be motivated to kind of do what you're doing? And it talks about these four elements of, you know, what do you love to do? What are you good at? Uh, what does the world need or sort of um, uh, what way in which you're serving the world? And what can you be paid for? And, and I think these four ideas of, uh, bringing those together um, takes self-awareness. You have to figure out what your talents are. You do have to be thoughtful and, and uh, considerate of, um, you know, what do you, what do you love, right? What, what's the interest to you? And I think the undergrad process and experience allows people to explore those four regions, right? What can you be paid for? What does the world need from you? Um, I think within that it takes thought and consideration and um and so self-awareness just being being thoughtful about your journey and and not just think of these 40 courses that you're taking as sort of just hoops that you have to jump through but alongside and through those 40 courses uh taking advantage of exploring and considering and and redefining success for you yeah i mean as as you know, campy as it sounds, reflecting is extremely important, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And it's been critical for, for me too, uh, as I've gone through, uh, to, to uh, constantly critique myself and critique what works and what hasn't and, and, and then develop as I go. Excellent. So uh, in honor of one of uh, school's newest clubs, I want to ask you a very important question. Sure. Uh, what is your favorite type of lettuce? Favorite type of lettuce? That's an interesting question. Yeah, so I love all sorts of lettuce. I have salads all the time. I'm vegetarian, vegan, so, you know, not vegan, but I eat a lot of vegan food. And um, So, you know, I love all sorts of lettuce. I'll have to go with classic romaine. Classic romaine, romaine with Caesar, <laughs> Caesar dressing. That's, that's, that's awesome. Excellent. Folks, you, you heard it first. Romaine, currently top, top position right now. There you go. Resisticles, number one. Yeah. So once again, thank you so much for being able to uh, allow us to interview for the uh, Professional Interpersonal Development Podcast. It's been a pleasure having you. And, it's um, been great to connect, Martin. Yeah, and, and thanks so much for the conversation. I really appreciate it. This episode of PID was sponsored by the freshest club in school, The Lettuce Club. Check them out on Instagram. A special thanks to Sujay Kumar, also known as Noise Yaga Beats, for the music supplied. Stay tuned for our next episode premiering on Tuesday, September 1st. Let's see where the conversation takes us.